So good afternoon everybody. My name is Anne Smith. I'm an advocate for women's rights and based in Dublin. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak at this event marking International Women's Day. What I'm going to talk to you today about is an important and indeed historical event that's taken place just recently in Ireland, the so-called repeal of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. And I think that anyone living in Ireland would have to be living under a rock to not know all about the Eighth Amendment. It's been top of the agenda in the press and in political life for the best part of this year. And it's been an incredibly divisive issue that has threatened to pull the very fabric of Irish society apart. Personally, I feel like it's all anyone has talked about for the past six, seven, eight months. That said, I know that our audience here today is international, and so I'm going to start by giving you some background on what the Eighth Amendment was all about. So, the Constitution in Ireland, up until very recently, effectively banned abortion under any circumstances. And on the 25th of May this year, the Irish electorate voted to repeal the Eighth Amendment, allowing the government to legislate on abortion. Abortion had already been illegal in Ireland under an act that was passed into law in 1861. And in 1983, a group of pro-life activists feared that this could be changed. So they set about securing protection for the unborn in the constitution by lobbying the government for a referendum. On that basis, a vote was held in September 1983, which proposed adding an Eighth Amendment to the Constitution of Ireland. And the amendment read as follows. The state acknowledges the right of life of the unborn and with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother, guarantees in its laws to respect and as far as practical to defend and vindicate that right. The referendum was passed with 66.9% voting yes and 33.1% voting no. The turnout for the vote was 53%, amounting to 1.2 million people. And this effectively gave equal rights to the mother and the unborn child, all but banning abortion. What's important to remember here is that the Eighth Amendment took place at a time in Ireland when the nation was very heavily regulated by Catholicism. Society was absolutely secretive when it came to crisis pregnancy and the national tendency was to brush problems under the carpet, and in the case of abortion, to send them across the Irish Sea to the UK. But nine years after the Eighth Amendment in 1992, the so-called X case marked a watershed moment in Ireland's abortion journey. It was a 14-year-old girl who became pregnant as a result of rape. She came to be suicidal, which she, and she was prevented from traveling to Britain to have an abortion. But the Irish Supreme Court ruled that she didn't have a right to an abortion because, excuse me, they decided that she had a right to an abortion because there was a real and substantial risk to her life and that of the unborn child. So this sparked huge debate once again across the country. It highlighted problems with the Eighth Amendment. And as a result, three referenda were held simultaneously on the same day in November 1992. The 12th Amendment attempted to remove suicide as grounds for an abortion, but was defeated. And the 13th and 14th Amendments acknowledged that women could travel abroad for terminations and that information about services in other countries could be made available to them. Both of these were passed, both were added to the Constitution. And the change was essentially an acknowledgement that in spite of the ban, many women simply went abroad for terminations. So fast forward to 2010, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that Ireland was violating the European Convention on Human Rights, citing the lack of clarity available to women on what circumstances could constitute grounds for a legal abortion. And then in 2012, the case of Savita Halepanavar caused shockwaves and led to widespread protests in Ireland because what happened was a young dentist was admitted to a hospital in Galway with complications during pregnancy. And her doctor said that it was inevitable that she was going to have a miscarriage. 
but they refused to, to terminate her pregnancy. Um, she was told that it was a Catholic country, that it couldn't be done, and so on. And she died in the same hospital a few days later from sepsis. Um, personally, I have no doubt that the Savita case brought about a huge change in the mindsets of large swathes of the population. They were shocked to think that a woman could be left to die without a miscarriage, and the medical staff that were supposed to be looking after her were absolutely powerless to do anything about the situation. And so, a year after Savita's death in 2013, a new act was passed into law defining the circumstances in which abortion could be carried out legally. There were three scenarios. The first was the risk of loss of life as a result of physical illness. Um, the second, a risk of loss of life from physical illness in an emergency. And the third, a risk of loss of life from suicide. And that then brings us up to today, 2018. The campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment, which effectively, as I said, has its roots as far back as 1983, had picked up speed in recent years, and it was buoyed in a way by a new generation of feminists. There was also a growing appreciation of the wider need for equality and for rights. And then there was also the success of the same-sex marriage referendum in 2015. The debate around abortion can be and often is toxic. There is perhaps no other issue that is quite as complex or divisive. And of course it encompasses a whole range of subjects, including politics, public morality, personal conscience, human biology, and gender equality. And unfortunately in Ireland, the run-up to the referendum was marred by misinformation and personal attacks. So neither the pro-life nor the pro-choice side cover themselves in glory, it has to be said. But for many Irish women, it was the first time that they felt able to tell their stories of traumatic or crisis pregnancies, miscarriages, difficult births, the shame of being forced out of Ireland to access abortion. Many older women were able to find a voice, which in many cases have been silenced for a long time and they share their own experiences. They talked of fear, of being ignored, repressed, overruled by family, husbands, the state, and of course, the Catholic Church. The exportation of abortion was reality, and a government endorsed solution to a problem that they had never known how to face. So, unfortunately, the debate became increasingly ugly with both sides refusing to listen to the other, or to deal with the questions raised by those who struggled with the moral side as well as the practicalities of abortion. But for me, this referendum, above all else, was about women's rights. Because in Ireland, under the Eighth Amendment, women had no bodily autonomy. I can't imagine a world where men could allow the law of the land to dictate their reproductive rights. It simply would not happen. Women seek abortion for various different reasons. Perhaps their method of contraception has failed. The economic or social struggles of pregnancy are too much. Perhaps they've been raped. They have children and they feel they can't cope with another. Maybe they're older. Or perhaps they may have a fatal abnormality that is going to affect their child. For me, the referendum was about doing the right thing about for our sisters, our daughters, our mothers, ourselves, and it was about granting women the right to bodily autonomy. And in addition, it's important to remember that the Eighth Amendment had drawn criticism from international groups, the UN, Amnesty International, because of its inhumanity. It raised issues that unsettled many people to the core, the central of which was, of course, again, the right to life of the unborn versus the right to have control over your own body. The two main parties in Ireland, Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, didn't take official positions on the referendum, but politicians were allowed to campaign on a personal basis, including the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar, who supported a yes vote. And so on the 25th of May this year, voters were asked if they wanted to repeal the Eighth Amendment and allow the government to legislate on abortion. The text to be added to the relevant article of the Constitution 
read as follows. Provision may be made by law for the regulation of termination of pregnancy. The government proposed that it would legislate to permit abortion in cases where there is a risk of life for the woman, a medical emergency, or a fatal fetal abnormality, or up to 12 weeks without any justification. And so, on the 25th of May, Ireland voted to repeal the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, paving the way for legalisation of abortion in some circumstances. The country voted by 66.4% against 33.6% to remove the amendment, with more than 2 million votes cast. The turnout was one of the highest ever recorded for referendum in the country, at 64.5%. So the result was a landslide victory for the S side, which had led in all of the opinion polls in any case all throughout the campaign. And the yes result was almost unanimous across the country, with 39 out of 40 constituencies voting in favour. The yes result also spanned across almost all demographic groups. According to exit polls, it was supported across all social classes, across both urban and rural centres, by both men and women, and by supporters of all of the country's main political parties, apart from one. The only major demographic group that did not support repealing the Eighth Amendment was that of people aged over 65. So the reference to the equal right of life of the unborn will now be removed from the Constitution and Ireland will bring in abortion laws that are similar to the vast majority of other countries in Europe. Uh, the work has begun on passing the draft into law and that will allow, again, for abortion um, on an unrestricted basis for up to 12 weeks of pregnancy and in limited circumstances after that, up to six months. So the hope is that the legislation will be passed by the end of the year. For Savita Halapanavar, obviously the result comes much too late. Um, impromptu tribute to Savita could be seen on one of Dublin's main streets during the referendum. There were flowers that were laid there in the days leading up to and after the referendum. And Savita will not be forgotten. And as for present and future generations of Irish women, they at least have finally been granted access to the re reproductive health care, bodily autonomy, and freedom of choice that they have always deserved. Thank you for your attention.